evidentemente Piao Logón, que ayer no pudo acompañarnos por un problema con el, con el vuelo, hoy sí puede acompañarnos y me hace mucha ilusión poderle presentar, que es el presidente del Partido de la Izquierda Europea. Tengo a mi derecha, a, aparte de una amiga, a una compañera de la izquierda, que es Karima Deli. Through a uh, problem of coordination, he didn't uh, get the chance to speak, so he's going to be the first one. Monse Pineda from the CEDAO platform. Hello, Monse. Then we have also Ismael González with that from the Popular Solidarity Network. Antoni Barbara from uh, Dampeus for la Salud Pública. Llorenç Planacoma from the anti-fracking uh, platform, Antonis Cavadias, a trade unionist from uh, Greece. Hello. Alicia Corrado, um, who is here with us. And my friend David Abril from MES Par Mallorca. And we have with us, and we are very ha happy, Heights Bilbao, who is with us. And I think that I've mentioned everyone. Pablo Ferreiro, sorry, uh, the secretary of uh, Communist Foundation. Thank you. Let's start and I'll give the floor to Pierre Loran so he can start the panel. Yesterday I couldn't be with you, so I apologize. I was in Athens on Thursday night and I had transportation problems. I know that yesterday was a fruitful day, successful day as well as today. I think that this forum of the countries of the south of Europe celebrating this forum when the Syriza uh, probably will win tomorrow, it's very pertinent because as, I, as the declaration of the forum says, and this is the panel topic of right now. The main issue in Europe is the need to renew Europe from an ecological and social point of view. We've been uh, going through five years of democratic and social freezing period. And all these years have really uh, shaped the continent. The threats, the suffering are extreme throughout Europe. And we live in a continent, a continent which is divided. We feel that now there are forces which have been building up in Europe. And these movements, these forces are going to trigger a dynamics, a positive one, to rebuild Europe. And probably 2015 can be the year in which things are going to become true. I think that the probably that if Syriza wins tomorrow, it's going to be a major event having a great impact throughout Europe. I think this is something that it's going to liberate some forces, some movements in Europe that need a political help. Sometimes it's difficult to find the way. And it's obvious that what's going to happen tomorrow in Greece, it's not an isolated event for Greece. It's something very important for Europe. And the uh, dimension of the political debate shows this to us. We can see that they are um, forces from the European left here people who attended the last meeting uh, of Syriza, well, we were many numerous. We can open the door to alternatives. It's not just that Syriza will win the elections tomorrow, the success of this forum. 
shows us that there is an alternative and the diversity of the movements of the associations who are gathered here shows that we can work together. But there are other things showing us that we are in a moment of change. The decisions taken yesterday or two days ago by the European Central Bank point to a change. This is a change in the policy of the European Central Bank that refused in the past to uh, provide liquidity and that provoked a crisis a few years ago. And the fact that the European Central Bank is changing its policy, it's due to the fact that they are in a road without a dead end road. And the European Central Bank has failed several times. There are there is a lot of money which is going to be used, but not for a social cause. We and we have to fight for this, and this is going to benefit some processes of accumulation of money. So we have to start a big battle in Europe. I would like to add, and this is the last remark I'm going to make, what has just happened in France with the terrible attacks in Paris against Charlie Hebdo. These attacks and the popular reaction that the attacks triggered, I, th I think it's the most, uh, it's the biggest popular reaction since 1945. Never since then in France we had seen or witnessed such a big demonstration or popular reaction. And that shows that we need new responses, new actions in Europe that have to be taken. The millions of French people who took to the streets didn't do it against the war. They do it for the republic of equality and fraternity as well as freedom. And they wanted peace and coexistence in Europe, in the Mediterranean area, in France. Uh, a political battle has started to use this popular movement. And the issue here is to know if the, the reply to this uh, popular uh, manifestation or this popular movement is going to be um, reply to drone us or if it's going to take us to more equality, fraternity, and freedom. I think it's the only way to answer to what's been stated in France by the population. I think that we have to impose on Europe a political landmark in order to uh, change democracy and the social dimension of Europe. So we would like to encourage to boost the movement for change by making proposals in order to re-establish Europe from a social perspective. And the government of Syriza, it's what's doing. And it's important because for the first time, a European government will put in the public agora, will force the rest of European government to discuss about an alternative to the austerity policies. And it will be the first time since the beginning of the crisis. And this political debate and our effort of solidarity to make uh, Syriza proposals well known, this will show us that we have to succeed for the ben benefit of all Europeans. This is a fight that is going to be fought in the coming months. 
And we, in all our countries at the European level, we have to foster conver political convergence uh, processes in order to set up a new Europe from a social perspective. And the for this forum is a big event. It's a reference point in this battle of political construction. And there will be other forums on the 30th and 31st of May in Paris. We are preparing a forum for the alternative. And the goal is to widen this movement of political convergence because we can see that there are social, green, uh, and left uh, political forces with a different traditions, but we need bigger, increased convergence because we need to increase the level of forces to be stronger in face or against these uh, financial forces. And if we want to implement a new Europe from an environmental and social point of view. So what's happening right now in Greece, it's very important. What's happening today here, it's very important. What will happen in France uh, in May, it will be very important also. And all this is also being made in Germany, in Italy, sometimes with a little bit differently. But we have to increase, as I say, the convergence efforts. And we've been working for many years in that direction. And what we've done, and the fact that Tsipras is the can, was the candidate uh, for the European com Commission was a little bit the sign of this conversion work, this joint work. And I think 2015 will be strategic year for all of us. So it's very important to go beyond a certain level. So our comrades, our colleagues from Syriza can be successful and have spaces for hopes that are so needed in many countries. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to be here with all of you. And for me, it's very important to say thank you for the unity that exists. Today, it's a unique moment here in Catalonia, of course, to support Syriza which is a country, a party that probably it's going to win tomorrow in Greece, and it will be in power. It's time to change things. It's simple. It's mo the moment for a real change. The victory of Syriza is a um, breaking point, a turning point also, an opportunity for all of us for what? to implement a new project at a European level, because Europe is not going in the right direction. Our populations tell us we don't like the Europe we have. They uh, don't like it, and we cannot accept this. I don't know if you've read in the paper, there is a Oxfam report saying that 1% of the richest people in the world have more than 50% of uh, wealth in the world. And we don't want this power relationship. This is, and we want to be very clear, we all together, we have to have 99% of wealth by means of social policies. And what have they done for the past 30 years? They have set up an um, anti-democratic monster, a monster called Troika. And the Troika has set up 
catastrophic policies in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, and tomorrow in other countries. And we can see the consequences also in France of these policies. Years of inequalities. What's the balance? This is the poverty, um, rising unemployment, and getting rid of the hope of people, killing the hope. When we see unemployment in Greece, which is very high, Europe is only is going only to react when we reach 60% of uh, young, young people under 30 unemployed. And for me, this figure, as in other countries of Europe, for this generation, this is a scar in the face of Europe. How can we be so blind when we have such high unemployment? How can we turn a blind, a blind eye when you see population suffering? We have to change the music and the DJ. This is why we need to wake up. We need something positive, and we have to go beyond. We need, we need new representative, new ideas, new forms in order to implement those policies. Why? Our institutions, our political parties are obsolete, uh, belong to the 20th century. So we need a new momentum for uh, the policy, a policy that suits people, that serves people. And we have to say we don't fear. We are living in the 21st century. It's a brave century. We have to develop mindsets and our ways of governing. We have new tools, I think, about internet. I'm thinking about new ways of activism that is going to help the political debate. So there is a threat today. Obviously, there is a threat. No doubt about it. A threat over people provoking despair. The, and I can say it because I was facing Marine Le Pen. Um, she's talking about uh, gypsies, about immigrants, and now unemployed people, as if unemployed people uh, were people that uh, we can only help in society. This is why Syriza is going to do a lot of good for society. We support also green uh, political party in Greece. It's the moment to uh, assume um, political historic responsibility. We are going to jump on the wagon. And um, I think that we have a mission. We all have a mission. Either you are a militant, a politician, member of an association, a leader of a trade union, we have to show that men and women stand up for their rights, that we don't accept the current situation. If uh, there are alternatives, and there are alternatives, we don't have to wait for the politicians to tell us what we have to do. The new seeds for hope are working, have been sown, and there is an urgency here. There is an urgency because challenges are numerous. Fight against climate change, for instance. We know it's not a national matter. No one can think that the fight against uh, tax havens is going to be solved at the national level. No one thinks this. Or the fight against social inequalities. We cannot think that this is going to be solved by one country. The European playing field, it's 
the level we need to get out of not the crisis, but the crisis in plural. So we have to say it very clearly. Syriza and other European left parties, some people say, these people, these guys are against Europe. No, let's make it clear. We are not against Europe. We are for another European project. It's not enough just to say that we are against this kind of Europe and that we need another Europe. We need specific solutions and we can have, we can access these solutions. For instance, it's of the utmost importance to, at least according to my opinion, to fight against poverty because it's outraging to see that in Europe 125 million people in Europe live under the threshold of poverty. And among these people, 30% are young people who live in very precarious conditions. So the solution is simple. We have to have a minimum income at a European level. This is feasible. This is the first idea. Secondly, we have to put an end to this casino financing system. The time has come to put some order, particularly concerning banks, and to finish with tax havens. Tax havens represent a trillion euros. We have to fight against social dumping and tax dumping. So we have to impose a tax of 25% to companies because one state alone cannot fight against giants such as Mittal or Amazon. So we have to stand together in order to find solutions. I know very well this problem because in the European Parliament, I am in charge of the housing problem. And we are in Spain. I know the problems you have in terms of housing. To dream, we need a place to sleep. If without a house, a flat, one cannot have children, one cannot look for a job or a study. Europe has fundamental rights, and each human being has the right to a place to live. So we have to fight and say no to all evictions that are taking place now. Families are evicted and they live in the street. We have to end up uh, also with the loan, uh, uh, the problems families have with to repay loans. Housing has to be affordable. We have to stop accumulating wealth in the hands of a few. And we have to work also on energy uh, precarity. Fam families pay 15% of their income to pay en for the energy. So they have decided not to heat the house because they cannot pay the electricity bill. So we have to reverse the situation. We are not going to outsource our house to China. So if we work on this issue, we are going to create jobs in the future in the energy sector. There is potential. I'm fully convinced of this. Women in Spain, they have, they have fight for the right uh, of uh, abortion or women throughout the world that have said they have rights. So we will have to fight for these rights at the European year level because there must be an equality and wage equality between men and women, equality and parity in the boards of companies. And in a few months, Something very important will happen in Paris, in France, the Climate Change Summit. 
will take place. Why is this topic an urgency? All experts agree on the fact that if we don't do anything, the planet will heat up by four degrees and um, there is no way back. It's impossible. We cannot leave a sick planet to future generations. We have a historical responsibility. We have to fight against CO2 emissions um, by means of a less polluting transport so we consume less carbon. We want to build societies where it's pleasant to live. Um, in Spain, in Greece, there is an extraordinary common good called the sun. And with the sun, we can produce energy. We can produce a new future. So the, we can foster this renewable energy sector. We can create green jobs. We have to see the world in uh, with uh, other eyes, some a p sweet place, nor a place for competitiveness. Uh, we are told that we have to create jobs in Europe because we have to grow, but grow. We have to grow. We know that today um, we have a labor problem. We have to reassess how we function, how we consume. All these models, the, all the models we have now, have to be changed. We cannot continue with a productivist system. We have to have a an economy which has solidarity. We have to change the model. We want a model with the goal of a public service. We are witnessing how public services are being destroyed in uh, the health system in school. The public services is a security net network for our societies. We have to fight and put an end to cutbacks and we have to develop public services as well. If tomorrow this change takes place, our society model cannot be sacrificed for the benefit of corporations. What are we doing now? A treaty with the state that is benefiting uh, corporations and they are choosing our model of society for tomorrow. We don't want uh, GMOs. We don't want fracking endangering our planet in the future society. So together we have to say no to this transatlantic treaty with the states. And I would like to finish because otherwise um, they are going to tell me that I've spoken for too long. But I would like to conclude by saying that 2015 will be a landmark year in Greece, in Spain. There will be also elections and we can change uh, history to relaunch uh, Europe and have um, more a uh, Europe with more ecology, more solidarity, a Europe that protects a federal Europe also. And tomorrow, of course, we won uh, Syriza to win uh, the elections. And we hope also that in Spain there will be a change because tomorrow all cameras will be watching what's happening in Syriza. I'm going to say three words in Spanish to finish. The fight continues and we will win. Good afternoon, well, and friends. Uh, I represent a small Green Party that decided three weeks ago to work together with Syriza. I don't know whether you have this uh, running joke that we used to have in Greece about greens. When we first appeared, they say, oh, you greens, you look like watermelons. <laughs> Green outside, but you are red inside. It remains to be seen. It remains to be seen working together with our comrades from Syriza. 
What we have been living, as we have been discussing these two days, is a cancellation of practically of all our dreams, all our given certainties and realities. Violation of environmental protection, rules and regulations, fast track processes, fracking, etc., uh, etc. Et the worsening of position of women through unemployment and through the resurgence of stereotypes concerning women. Women do not need that much of a job. They can stay at home and take care of kids. It has been like 30 or 40 years that we used to hear this thing. It's coming back again. The destruction of labor class that was accompanied by the destruction of middle class. And mind you, middle class has been the backbone of stability in Western democracies. Now it's the unknown in front of us. The deterioration of public service, services and the state that is becoming smaller and smaller. Some are talking about the withering away of the state. Due to the cutbacks and austerity, we are leaving the re the, an attempt to re-nationalize particular problems. We have had the resurgence of nationalism in dealing with problems, the exchange of stereotypes. What we have been living is a multifaceted crisis that was portrayed in the beginning as economic crisis, but it is also social, it's environmental, and it's also moral. The value systems that have been uh, displayed in Europe are under severe crisis. What we need to do, as it is evident, has been evident from the discussion that we have had in these past two days, is that we need to build broad alliances because the problems are much more complex and have a different dynamic. And unless they are tackled from different points of view through alliances, it's very difficult if not impossible to deal with, it, with them. The left has had a very good tradition in deconstructing and challenging neoliberal paradigm. That has been successful, at least in our ears. I mean, we more or less have been dealing with parallel political parameters. What we need, though, to understand is that there has been an ideological battle that we had lost since the early 90s with the collapse of the Soviet uh, system and their allies. What we have had ever since is practically a mind colonization. Unions are bad, the state is expensive, it's unproductive, pigs, getting rid of the fat, these are expressions that are commonly used and they describe the same, the very same thing. The way we are thinking has been imposed by others on us. So it is extremely difficult for us to think outside this framework. And this is exactly what I think we need to tackle in our meeting. And there is much work that needs to be done uh, in the future. Are we going right now, the left forces with green forces, to replace social democracy? Are we going to replace social democracy discussing to the middle class in the same way that previous social democratic governments was doing? Are we going to learn from the mistakes and the shortcomings of social democrats so we can perhaps radicalize the middle class, especially at this very moment? These are crucial and very difficult uh, tasks. For example, in my country, we had a baby, an infant, uh, social welfare, st uh, welfare state, but by and large, it was based on clientelism. If we are to rebuild a welfare state, how can we get rid of clientelism? This is a difficult task. If we are to start with a new model, are we going to rely against our numbers, calculations, on all these, allow me to say, pseudo-scientific uh, um, uh, packaging that have been dealing with in the past? Can we stick to our principles and develop our own ideas, our own role, role models, create what Gramsci used to say, our own hegemony? This is a very difficult task. Neoliberalism has been an ideology-driven project. And we should not repeat the same mistake. We should not just rely on ideology or move our actions based on ideology. We have to create sustainable institutions with elements of direct democracy that will serve 
as mechanisms for checks and balances, as a guarantor that what we aim at doing will actually happen. It will not remain in paper. We have to work together with all forces that see climate change as a major threat to humanity. We have to deal with productionism, as many comrades refer, said before. We should not deal with the environment as production material, the animals as targets or means, the earth as a trophy. We need a new ideological battle so that we can safeguard all these ideas that we all share. At the same time, we have to understand that we cannot be reminiscent about the times that we lived in the early, in the first decade of the 21st century. At least in Greece, that's what we are realizing right now. Overconsumption has never been on our agenda. We never wanted to create an overconsuming society. We never wanted to develop a society where nouveau riche behaviors become not dominant behaviors. We never thought of creating a society that bases its development on construction. Here it's housing. In my country it's roads after roads after roads. We have, at the same time, to be able, in our idea, idea to capture the hegemony, we have to understand neoliberalism's inconsistencies and contradictions. To give you an example, how on earth can parties that are Christian Democrat deal with poverty in such a brutal way? It's absolute brutality the way we deal with numbers when they're talking about people who are dying or they're very close to death. This hegemony that I'm imagining or I would like us to start thinking of needs to be conveyed in a modern way with modern tools. You remember yesterday we watched this wonderful uh, advertisement of Syriza. Unfortunately, nobody translated it. You know, there's been this growing fear, an attempt to have us all become fearful that something will happen. The end of the world is happening. Uh, all these millennia ideas are, have become very popular by the government. So this ad, I don't know how many of you watched it yesterday, starts by saying that on Sunday night, an asteroid will pass close to Earth. So, and the next day, people will wake up. They will take their kids to school. They will wait on the bus. Couples will walk away holding hands, etc., etc. So we need to use modern ways of coming closer to people, coming closer to their needs. We need to use mass media, social, new social media. We have to use education, both formal and informal. We have to create our own soft power. This is what we need to do. We can identify role models, individuals. We can identify collectivities that have, had, uh, that have, had, have helped in these times of crisis. There are initiatives that are working in our societies. They are mushrooming in Greece. Many comrades referred to in the past. I'm reading also about similar things happening. We need to map them out. We shouldn't be afraid of you. These are our success stories. These are our good practices. They need to be conveyed to the people in an organized manner because this is part of the society we have on our minds. Conclusions. We need to build this a new ideological hegemony based on reality and based and being transferred in the speak of everyday people. Two, we need to be open and learn from each other in our plural existence and not just use plurality as an empty slogan. Three, we should defend what needs to be defended and change what needs to be changed. And four, and I'm talking now to us Greeks, we need to learn to accept solidarity, but also criticism. And we will be needing your criticism in the days to come, not only your support until Sunday night. We will be needing your criticism. And this is how you build good relations if you are honest with each other. Thank you very much. OK, we are now going to give the floor to those who are here with us. I'm going to be strict with time. You have four minutes each. So we will finish on time. So I will be quite strict. First, Albert Jiménez. 
So I apologize for not having given him the floor before. OK, Albert, you have the floor. Well, in reality, what I wanted to say is that I thank you for putting me in another panel, because now I can contextualize this from a social point of view, something I can do now. So thank you for the opportunity to be out of the script, although I have to improvise now. And this gives me the opportunity to use the metaphor I've used before the APAC, we're green outside and red inside. Although sometimes people don't say that. First of all, since we are in a European forum, let me point to a specific question. In all the countries of Europe, especially the south of Europe, all over Europe, there are problems of housing. And of course, they are adjusted to the conditions of every state. The Spanish state, there were and there still are the conditions for the perfect storm, abusive law, bubbles, which generated and still generates the situation we're living now. In other countries, we didn't have these conditions, but for example, in Germany and France, we don't have so many mortgage problems, but there are problems related to renting. Or for example, in countries such as Italy, in which the rents are protected, but not the mortgage. And there are living cases of occupies, such as in Spain and Greece. In Spain and Greece, there was this moratorium of eviction, which was prolonged, but it's reaching its end. In any case, what I want to point to with this idea of the problem of housing in Europe is two fundamental concepts. First, we have not attacked in any case, in a fundamental, radical way, the problem of housing from a European national way. All we have are the consequences of a social, democrat, sclerotic, non-functional policies. And secondly, we have an aggression of the global capital against the popular working classes, not only in the Spanish state, but also at the European level. So let me make a very brief excursion. I think it's fundamental for you to understand why. All this is done through a mechanism which the ecologists call securization. And basically, what it does is that the capital which has been invested in a fixed way, in a specific physical way, such as housing, becomes liquid in space and time through the financial markets and secondary markets. Therefore, what it does is to allow the capital to circulate much quicker. Not only that, but it frees it up from these material limits, drawing it closer to this imagined cycle of capital in which it becomes even more valuable. So we have capital and benefits we have without having to do through this unpleasant situation of people working at 6 o'clock to go to work and doing things for the owner. This mechanism is working not only at the European level, but at the global level. And this mechanism is the one we have to combat in a collective way. In this sense, we, from the platform of Addicted, from the uh, APAC, we understand that this is a global mechanism working from the capital to working class. And our main objective, of course, besides getting people not to lose their house home and having a place to live, is the articulation of a subject of a class, a political subject who is able to claim for its rights from a political perspective. And in order to do that, what we need is practice, daily practice, daily articulation of fights from the bottom, the generation of counterpower spaces where we can create our own hegemony. People who are not used to deciding in anything in their lives can, for the first time, free, active, feel active subject of something. People who are used to being shaken from an economic point of view to become part of this system, uh, they feel like subjects. And their actions matter, and they do achieve things. And this is exactly what we want to do from our platform, from the attack. How do we do it? Well, the way we do it is that we have tried to overcome this old dichotomy between reform and revolution. And we try to understand that there's still a relationship 
between both of them, reform, exhaust these institutional ways, uh, legitimizing the status quo in order to give a new status quo which we can start again this cycle. And this is why we think that instead of having revolutionary ends and using reforming methods, we have ends which are reformist, but revolutionary methods are the ones who are helping us to articulate this subject, which is the one bringing the political change. And we think that from the attack, capital is under attack in three axes and two ways. Three axes in which we attack capital as a ideology and accumulation. Uh, what we want is to de-mercantilize housing, to end up with monopolies, rentings, mortgage, and what they do is to allow banks and the financial capital to exploit the working class. And as a social relationship, the housing crystallizes inequalities of capitalism. There is no other way of knowing which class does a person belong to than going to their neighborhood. Schools, which is determined by where he lives. This is what we attack, questioning these relationships of ownership. And the debt, which is established in order to generate new ways of control and social discipline is the typical sentence of owners, no proletarians, or the politics of dismantling of public housing of Michael Thatcher. And finally, as an ideology, we question private property, the superiority of the market, and accumulation of capital. I say we're working in two fronts, institutional and civil disobedience. I'm trying to summarize. We understand that by civil disobedience is the one that has to create this common subject, but it can only be done from the antagonism, collective antagonism, as a class, in front of the capital presented by the banks and financial interest. As I was saying at the beginning, democracy sovereignty, but sovereignty is anti-capitalism. There is more sovereignism in the mail of someone who is occupying the blocks, uh, the social block, than the whole of the executive party of Convergencia and Unión. Now that we talk about federalism, I finish with this, I promise. The South, the South of Europe should lead this fight because it's the South of Europe, the one who is more developed from this building, um, as Groucho was saying, we are uh, Western and we are proud to be. And um, when the capitalism of the North collapses, we will tell them, welcome. I give the floor to Monse Pineda. Thank you, first of all, for having invited me. I hope not to be the only, only women uh, in that side of the stage, uh, to be a minority, because we are two here, so we are a minority. I'm going to talk about three issues. Feminism as an answer, the city, and I've written it. So the patriarch is the uh, social and the structural order establishing discrimination, exclusion, precariousness, violence as a natural situation, um, something that divides us and standardizes us. And women feel this inequality. The society led by men is a way defining the world, how we experience relationship and having gender policies, churches, schools, and also political parties. I'm going to talk about privileges, because in this way, we established privileges of um, all of us. And I would like to point out these privileges exerted um, by men, mostly, because I'm going to ask you something. Think about your privileges, the privileges you have, the privilege you have as a man, and that uh, you can see in the actions you do. 
it's true that as a political action, we know that we have to think about the neoliberal uh, model that <coughs> we as a human beings implement, but we have to think also about the privileges that as men we can uh, exert. And I think we have to demand you, to ask you that to, to renounce to your privileges because this is the biggest challenge for you men, to renounce to your privileges. Because revolutions are true when they are based on the deconstruction of what we have learned. And we say that if the promised uh, revolution is not uh, written uh, with women, will not take place. And young women have to be present in this revolution because otherwise the feminism we want will won't take place and the revolution won't take place without women and it's not just the will of some of us because without women without young women the revolution i insist won't take place we are the answer because together with you men we will provide a decent and honest answer. The South needs to rebuild itself from the scratch. And we have to put an end to privileges of men because and not to have structures led only by men. But if social movements, we are the answer, we need states that guarantee our rights rights that this crisis have nearly destroyed. And this has been the perfect excuse for equality policies that wanted to correct or inequalities. Uh, well, these policies have been buried. The government has dismantled these policies. You know that the United Nations has mechanisms to make uh, states uh, comply with minimum human rights. And here we have the Convention Against Discrimination Against Women. States are obliged to uh, report on the measures they have established for certain periods in order to reduce or to uh, get rid of inequalities between men and women. States have the possibility, uh, the United Nations have the possibility to monitor uh, government actions and to present a um, report. We have submitted a report to the United Nations in June. It's going to be taken into account. And we have uh, denounced the Spanish government for dismantling all these policies. So now, very quickly, the summary is that in this period, 2008-2013, where the political institutions dealing with uh, equality have been dismantled. What does it mean? Well, it means that there is no future in the short and medium term for women, but for men also. We've denounced that these equality uh, structures, national and international, are disappearing and that uh, no plans of intervention are being made in order to correct imbalances concerning inequalities. We've seen that several activities have been uh, stopped and these initiatives were not uh, enough. I could give you hundreds of data, but I don't have time. Where I would like to say that austerity policies have set conditions that allow us to say uh, how uh, there is a miss, um, an approach against women in uh, policies. There is a uh, much uh, attitude in the government policies, and a government not guaranteeing the rights of women is a failed state. And I would like to point out also, as uh, it has been said, that it's very important to implement a counter reform. We had an example here in Spain. 
the law against abortion. It was a law against the right women's right and against uh, our sexual rights. This is an example how the policies from the north want to turn women into a slave of our bodies. Let's turn the south into a north. Without feminism, we cannot move forward. And I would like to remind you that we need policies to be policies that correct inequalities because otherwise we will be failing as a society. A few days ago, another woman in Catalonia was killed by uh, her uh, spouse, her partner. And this uh, killer, because we didn't have enough measures, we could, couldn't prevent this killing. And we have a lot of domestic violence. And this is the biggest failure of democracy. It's difficult in uh, five minutes, let alone four, to say what we think about half of the topics we are supposed to discuss. I belong to a new organization working in the Balearic Islands in Majorca, and it's a political force uh, from the left, um, green, and sovereign. And I'm going to talk about my island. It is an island which is a reference at a world level in tourism. And if we have a look at the stats, we could think that there is no crisis in Majorca. But uh, as in many other European countries, the crisis has been the excuse to deepen in a predator social uh, system that the elites and people from the right really want, a predator system for the environment, for culture and language identities. And there is a growing, growing dependency. And if you live in an island, you are even more vulnerable. So there is a growing economic, energy, food dependence, quite the opposite to what we should be doing right now. And not to mention the loss of uh, political sovereignty that we are suffer suffering in Spain, that is denying the right to choose uh, for the people in Catalonia, which accounts to denying democracy. So uh, 2014 has brought uh, an incredible number of uh, tourists to Majorca. It's been a record year. But at the same time, we had an immoral record, which is poverty, unemployment, inequality. We cannot talk about building a society for the future, a decent one. And this is the first change we need to perform, even if it's to start and to see the contradictions. I could mention stats, but I'm going to give you some examples. There is a survey done a few months ago by uh, the um, coordinator of trade unions in Latin America um, about the labor conditions of uh, people working in a hotel, cleaners in a hotel. And the study was done in Latin America. And it was about the labor condition of women working in hotels, cleaner ladies. So they are studying what's happening in Majorca. Because they were saying, well, be aware that we can go towards the direction uh, of labor conditions right now in Majorca. Another news I read. It was a documentary on a private uh, clinic and private health uh, system is doing very well. And it was a documentary uh, of a particular machine in that uh, private uh, clinic, the only one in Majorca. And the doctor was saying that it wasn't a machine for divers because, but 
immigrants that were intoxicated when they were trying to heat uh, themselves with coal for a barbecue. And this could be read along the lines. The coal, as the one we can find in Africa, in Colombia, so here we can see we import also waste from Italy, from other European countries. It is something that started uh, last year, uh, despite the fact that we opposed. And to all this, we have to add uh, um, oil prospection projects that are taking place around uh, the island. And this is a threat for the whole Mediterranean area. I think everything it, what's happening it's terrible and it's due to a way of interpreting policy, politics that has nothing to do with uh, the need of people and it's fostering the private interest and I don't have time here to comment on this. What are the strategies? Two strategies to have social majorities. We want to achieve a social majority. In order to be a social majority, we have to uh, have new policies. And new policies or new politics is the capacity to take all things with new things and to have alternatives at a global level. This is why I'm so, we are so happy to be here and to do it at the same time when the Davos Forum is taking place. People who say opposite uh, things to what we say here or the P popular pa Spanish Popular Party Convention, which is taking place in Madrid. And as it has been said by our colleague from Greece, we have to work at a local level because the change is possible. And the change is possible in a small experience, collective and democratic experiences that are taking place now with participatory governments at a local level. But in order to have a social majority and in order to have a viable alternative, we need a different narrative. I've uh, told you a little bit about uh, what's going on in Majorca. And we try to connect with people. Despite everything I've told you, Majorca is a paradise because we have 14 million tourists coming that want to spend some days in Majorca to be happy for a few days. So we, inhabitants of Majorca, we want to be happy also living there. We can tell me that this is a dream, and I would like to thank Syriza because tomorrow we will all dream and share the dream that another Greece and another Europe is possible. And I would like to thank uh, Greeks for having invented democracy and for giving democracy a new meaning from tomorrow onwards. Thank you. Only a few minutes. I'm going to talk about health. And on behalf of Dempeus of Per la Salut Pública, if you don't know this organization, it's a citizen's platform, a citizen organization of citizens that are empowered, plural, and that are fighting for uh, health. Um, if you are interested, please uh, feel free to contact me and to visit uh, the website Dampeus per la Seguridad Pública and you will find more information. We are seeing what's going on and we can see that things are very unhealthy, that we really have a problem. And when we talk about health, we talk about life. Uh, in the same sense as it has been mentioned now. Uh, health is uh, having an autonomous life, a happy life. It's uh, aspiring to happiness. And from this perspective of health, we are talking. And we are not just for crazy communists. Uh, the British uh, Journal says that this uh, authoritarian policies are bad for health. 
and the health of the next generation will be worse than the present uh, health uh, state. And Michael Marmot from the W and the World Health Organization says that uh, youth health is an emergency and it's very important. We want to talk about this topic. So health, uh, it's very important and it's not just a thing reserved for doctors or about pills. Health is uh, has to do with the social dimensions. While well, labor is important, housing is important, environment is important, education also. And when we talk about health, then we can have health systems that try to uh, deal with physical health. We say and we fight to have public health systems. And by public, I mean universal, without exclusions, quality systems, uh, with uh, funding. It's not free. It's not free because we are paying the health system with our efforts, our taxes, our money. So fair public health systems. I don't have enough time uh, and I don't want to make a list of mistakes and uh, horrible things that are affecting our health systems. Um, for instance, mental health, friends, suicides, the uh, danger of labor, uh, health, the they are using our language. They are talking about co-payment when, in fact, it's repayment. They are stealing um, public resources. So we live in very tough times, I would say in epidemic times. And it can get worse if the T, uh, TIP um, is passed on. This is going to be very, very bad for our health. It will be worse than Ebola epidemic. And we have to fight against it. And I'm going to respect the four minutes I've been allowed. I have to pay tribute to these 12 people that die in Spain from a disease that can, it's curable. Uh, they die because of hepatitis C. They are waiting for a sage people council and pharmaceutical to agree on patents and prices. If uh, the price uh, has to be 23 or 50,000, well, we maybe need a, a generic drug that costs 100 euros and that can be produced in India. And they are killing, and it's not a euphemism, they are killing people because they are privatizing. Last minute. There is treatment for all these diseases? Yes. Because I'm not going to give you a drug or for happiness. I think the recipe is someone something different. It's mobilization, mobilization, empowerment, having more public public health system, uh, public financing, protecting the right to health, it's preventing prevention, equality, social and cultural, uh, social. Um, economic situations to see how the health can improve if society if improves. And tomorrow, let's see what happens in Greece uh, where there is a bad health situation uh, as it is in Spain and Portugal and in Catalonia. So this is the prescription. We have to fight and fight here today in the south of Europe and throughout Europe. And if you allow me, not from a Eurocentric uh, perspective, we have to fight for health rights throughout the planet because the fight, fighting is something healthy. Thank Thank you for inviting me to this first forum coming from a north country. I'm talking about a problem that is very important for me. 
a problem which has been mentioned in the Barcelona Declaration. I'm referring to unbalances in trade, balances in Europe, because this unbalance are also the sign of a deeper unbalance with regards to the economic, social, and political situation among European countries. This is why I think that in the <coughs> declaration, it's fear to ask for a, an economic, macroeconomic readjustment as well as a social readjustment because this imbalance in the trade deficit affects not only countries having a high deficit, but also harms Europe. So the main responsibility here to correct imbalances among European countries is due to the German policy. The industrial German policy is based on the promotion of exports. And the success of German export means that other countries have a trade deficit and have problems from the economic and social point of view. And the uh, macro fiscal agreement imposed by the Merkel government is deepening and worsening the situation. This is why the German left parties ask for a complete change of the German and European policy. There are three elements to my mind that are key in order to correct Im imbalances. imbalances. First, in countries such as Germany with a surplus, we have to increase uh, in domestic demand by increasing wages and by increasing social spending. We have to take into account that in a country such as Germany, with regards to the high index of productivity, we have relatively low wages. This is why we have to increase wages as well as social spending in order to foster domestic demand. Second element, very important, we need public investment at a national level and at a European level in order to recover economically in the countries most affected by the crisis, to perform the social and ecological transition we need, and for public services as well. There are very specific proposals being made by the left parties and by trade European trade unions. For instance, I think it would be very interesting to adopt the proposal made by the European Confederation of Trade Unions, which is called New Path for Europe, with a proposal of 2% investment of GDP devoted to an investment program for a new energy policy to improve connections and to improve labor conditions. This is the second element. And the third element is a sustainable and fairer tax policies. So rich people pay more taxes. I think we need a levy on big uh, fortunes. And it was said yesterday that in order to reduce deficit, income have to increase. And this is why I need, I think that we need another tax system. And last point I would like to mention refers to the 
European Central Bank policy. I think this is very important. Draghi has announced the massive purchase of assets, but the problem is that this money goes to financial sector. Instead of uh, boosting economic development, this money could be used or will be used for financial speculation. We need this money to finance the needed public investment to develop socially. And we have to fight to force the European Central Bank to change its role. I think it's very important for an alternative policy. And with the victory of Syriza, I think we will have very favorable conditions to implement an alternative policy. But in order to do this, from a social point of view, the European Central Bank has to assume its share of responsibility in the European development and particularly to uh, create more employment. Thank you. About Greek debt, and this is the decision by the European Central Bank a couple of days ago. This is an episode of working classes and they don't, if they don't do anything, all the speculators will understand that the European bank was going to act like this. And to do this two days before the elections, it's a problem. It's too much of a problem. I think that they are much aware of the danger of Syriza in the living class of Europe than the left of Europe. This is the fear they have for me. The problem is that we talk about the left, about Syriza, as a problem of solidarity. It's not a problem of solidarity, it's a problem of common interest and the central bank is going to kill the government of Syriza. And, and this is a problem for everyone. So it's too much. And this is why I am here by saying that the problem, not one problem, but the problem is that we are going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the week after uh, February. Not only we're going to talk to we're going to talk about heats, etc., but we are going to explain the workers, the peoples of Spain, Italy, and France, that the government of Syriza is their own government, and if Syriza has and can change and modify the policies of Europe, if Syriza doesn't want, they don't want to modify the policies of Europe. I think that's a problem. And this is why I think that it's necessary when we go back home. I think this is the political problem that we are facing, uh, whether this is a left, more a greener left. That's not the problem. The problem is the possibility that we have now of this left of all the countries is going to do their own job next week. Four minutes. Let me explain you what it is, our network. First of all, a brief introduction. I think that colleagues who have talked before me have already explained how, what's the situation of this country and the consequences of what we call the crisis, which is nothing else than uh, deception. Why do we say that? We say that because we understand it's a planned process of articulation of dismantling of the welfare state in Spain. Those of you coming from outside, 
we've only had, as my colleague was saying, the remains of the welfare state. We never had the whole of the welfare state. We've always heard the sentence of structural reforms what we call a process of constituent process of the oligarchy and what they want is to end with what we call the welfare state. These structural reforms have been regulating employment to make it more precarious to allow the worker to be poor and to end up with uh, universal public health, as my colleague from the platform was saying related to health, this is very clear, and to deregulate public education to favor the entrance of the private and concerted education and the revolution of the citizens in a permanent way with the last Mordaza law. And this has a very solid consequence. It's important to talk about this. We talk about 25% unemployment in Spain, more than 5 million people, and 50% of those don't have any coverage currently. 1,800,000 families without any income at home. We talk about 22% of poverty in Spain. 22% and currently, and this is data of UNICEF, 25% of child poverty. 2.2 million children in this country live under the threshold of poverty. These are data given by UNICEF. It's not invented by any left organization. Plus eviction, suicides, and in this country, poverty is uh, something which affects workers. Even if you work, you can still be poor. A situation of social urgency due to a project of death, which is nothing else than the project of capitalism with guilty people, responsible people. And this is what we want to say when it comes to articulate this network of solidarity. What are these things called networks of solidarity? We think that the institutional relationships are not enough. We have responses to give. What are we going to promise people when Sirita wins? What are we going to do till then? How are we going to feed our people? How are we going to feed our families? How are we going to work day after day? Are we all together united, yes or no? This is what the Black Panthers were asking themselves a long time ago in the United States. And this is a question that the left, the left sometimes doesn't know how to respond. A uh, historical challenge, which is to give a response to specific needs of their own class, as we were saying here, of class. We have our needs cover, our family needs, and this is what we want, denouncing the system. Uh, that system of capitalism to articulate specific answers to specific needs and to articulate the program of solidarity, giving an answer to the situation of the welfare state. When we talk about solidarity, we are talking about articulating programs based on solidarity and not charity. Church should be in charge of uh, solidarity. The attack, for example, empowering people to make them protagonists of their own fight to change their reality. This is what we want. It's not a question of food sovereignty where people go and ask food at the doors of the supermarket to make poverty visible. We are not guilty of our poverty. We are victims of uh, an imbalance in the spirit. We talk about solidarity, food sovereignty. We talk about urban gardens. Solidarity urban gardens in the country, experiences of the popular power which have been created in Spain for a long time because these are experiences generating this popular power that we talk so much about. We talk about public universal health accompanying the migrants expelled from the welfare system because they don't have the card. We talk about, uh, to talk about going with these people and to see what drugs do our elderly need, our children, our families, because we don't have enough money to buy this. And the colleagues of Greece have already a very huge experience. And we talk about public education, popular education, not only privatizing education, but making more expensive school materials. And we cannot tell them that in public education, when a family with their wage cannot buy them enough material to start the school and let's imagine how he goes to school without this material because what they are doing is to end up with dignity of people and this is why we talk about projects 
of support to public education, and we talk about generating cooperatives of books, and we talk about doing exchange of books in public spaces, and defense against repression, defense against repression. iPhone, which is condemned in this country for participating in the strike, while Barthelas goes to the street and he does the symbol of for solidarity with his colleagues. And we talk about repression against social movements and defending through lawyers who don't get any money because they fight. Uh, like in 1977, the ones of Atoya, Atocha, who gave their lives for defending the rights of workers in this country, and many other initiatives, not only through the Solidarity Network, but other networks to defend every day, every strike, every action, every eviction, every action of popular demonstration to defend those people, those activists. And as I was saying, this is the question to be part of the people or not to be part of the people. And for those of you who are more in the classical line, when I said covering our working class uh, before, it used to be said that unless we organize ourselves, we will never be in the vanguard. And we, what we have to do is to protect those people and to have the capacity to feed our children. This is the reality that we have, and this is what the network of popular solidarity wants, to build now and not to promise something for the future, to build a new society, a new proposal to build on the ashes of this corrupt regime, a new reality, not to promise but to create a society, socialism, spaces for socialism, enough promises. We need to live our life in a dignified way, equal and free. Thank you. I'm a member of the Executive Secretary of the Bank Employees uh, Federation in Greece, and also I'm a member of the Bank and Insurance Committee of Syriza. Uh, it's very difficult to make a speech uh, not in your language, so I'm going to read some things. Excuse me for this. Uh, we are in the middle of historical moments in Greece. After seven years, of harsh and inhuman austerity, after seven years of brutal and undemocratic suppression, and finally after 35 years of neoliberal policies, we're very proud to announce you that we're one step away of making the dream of our generation come true, the dream of many comrades before us, uh, the government of the left. Uh, however, is that enough? Have we accomplished the true social transform transformation? Throughout this, this drive in Greece, the unions have played a key role. The workers that saw their standard of living to decline dramatically claimed decisively and massively the overthrow of austerity policies. Many of the unions who were used to simply operate as transacting instruments of governmental parties were suddenly transformed into areas of real political turnover, turnover but also into areas of political awakening and fermentation of new consciousness without this necessarily mean that uh, the coloration changed in favor of the left parties. The thing that uh, needs to be realized by us in Syriza and by all the left parties in Europe is that the governance and power, it was said yesterday, are, very, uh, are two very different concepts. If we don't want to be a parenthesis in the history books, then we have to realize that the governance by the left party without the real support of the workers and their validation is not just possible. The real social and socialistic transformation of any society is accomplished through the emergence of the unions, the unions as pioneer modulators of the political agenda and social demands. You know better than anyone, comrades, that the road to the true democracy of citizens is full of painful procedures and hard work. If we want to structure our own Europe of solidarity, we have to highlight to the workers that their interests are far from those of the capital. A first goal could be the agreement and the joint action of the workers in those countries down in debt, then the countries of the South. If we have a left political change in Greece, it would be unthinkable that our unionists in Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece 
to entrench themselves in, and not to organize a common plan with a common target. A, com a common target. We must include in our claims the restructure of the debt problem. We must organize common demonstrations, common strikes at the same day. We must demand equal wages and collective agreements for all of the South. We must take the union in our hearts, in our hearts comrades. We have to make the people realize their true usefulness. We have to plead to transform them from areas of harmless philosophy for the system to areas of uh, challenge and reversal. In conclusion, I was very brief. In Greece, we are preparing ourselves to live magic moments. That's true. It is also true that in this Sunday, we are preparing after a very long time to shed tears of joy. At the same time, we have no illusions about the historical responsibility that falls in our shoulders. If we fail in Greece to justify the expectations of a, deep, a deeply and really wounded society, if we fail altogether in Europe to turn the rage of citizens and workers into hope and change, then not, not only our, our left viewpoint will take decades to come back, but the prevalence of the neoliberalism we have, will be definitely a disaster for Europe itself. Comrades, we bring you from Greece a message of victory and hope. We can't direct the working forces of Europe into the unique way of dignity, the way of the left and the ecology. This Sunday, comrades, one of the stars of Europe is turning red. Uh, this Sunday, history is knocking in our door. Let's paint the, left, uh, the rest of the stars red. Uh, thank you very much. Venceremos. I had four ideas written down, and but I think I'm not going to read. Before the, tomorrow's victory, because we are going to win, I think it's important to celebrate small victories. Small victories that sometimes we don't celebrate. And I think that today it's a moment, and I will ask you for a round of applause for a small victory here in Catalonia a year and a half ago when fracking was um, prohibited. And I would like a round of applause, not for me, but for all the colleagues and friends that fought. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about this victory a year and a half ago. And I think the key of the victory were important, and it can, they can provide us a key for the future. I think that it was a people's uh, mobilization in La Garrocha, Uzona areas, in Lleida also, people got very involved. And the victory was possible also because there was a scientific and expert works that were very committed, com committed to this fight. Carlos, Pablo, Eva, Llorenz, and Llorenz is myself. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about this later on. And another key issue was political representatives that were working in parliament, such as Salvador, or Sara, or Hortensia, that were working in parliament for the cause. So when we all work together without wanting to monopolize the work, well, then success comes. And part of the success to stop fracking shale gas exploitation, but it's reaching many countries in Europe because many of them have the same problem. Well, the leadership was in the hands of women, political representatives, scientists. They all obey these peasant women in Ridaura, a city in Catalonia, and this was very important. I'm not uh, an expert, but someone should analyze this fact. I think the fact that uh, women were leading the project was very important. 
And something important also, and it's related to education, was that many of the experts that got involved in this movement against fracking could go to university. For instance, in my case, I was the first member of my family that could attend university. I think I was the first one in my family, as I insist, that could go to university in the 80s. I come from a very humble uh, family, peasants and uh, working people. And they want to destroy this also, because they know if that if people can go to university, well, people then have arguments and can find alternative for the social model we have now. And the, the rulers know this, and this is why they want education not to be public. So we don't, we cannot create alternative for this economic and social model. That population people cannot come up with alternatives. And this was also a success in this battle against fracking. Now we have the capacity to put forward alternatives after many, many years. And we have to take advantage of this opportunity. We are prepared now to change this socio-economic model. And I would like to mention fracking, which is affecting or can be a problem uh, uh, in Europe. It has many problems in France, Poland. In France, it was temporarily prohibited in the UK also. And it's a problem affecting Europe. And it can be a catalyst to change the socioeconomic model and to change these aggressive energies for a fair, clean, energy system. That's everything I wanted to say. Thank you. And finally, Annalisa Corrado. I'll try to keep it short also. And it's more difficult speaking another language. What we've seen so far is that the crisis we are facing are profound, wide crises of an unprecedented level. The economic, environmental, social rights crisis all together at the same time. And we have to face all these crises. And this, this shows us that this is a failure, failure of European policies, social policies. They are so different. We have a Europe very, very different from the European dream. Europe, it's also a continent where population is old, is dense in a small territory. And we don't have many primary resources or the resources um, as define as primary resources. So it's very difficult to exit the crisis. But in the challenges, we can find the opportunity to work together. Because the policies which have taken us to that point uh, were policies uh, that gave priority to industry or labor. But what has happened is that we have forgotten about something really important. And the challenge now is to exit the crisis, taking into account gender issues, uh, ecology, social issues. And a new paradigm is possible, an alternative is possible, only if all these uh, elements and all the people work together. And to talk about ecology, which is uh, where I know the best, now it's clear that the policy implemented so far, even if we are told that there is something more important, more urgent than ecology, political failures, failures 
have affected core issues such as water, air, food, health, waste management. All these are very basic things. And in Europe, uh, in Europe now, we talk about energy, TTIP, immigration. This is, and we have to tackle all, all these env environmental issues. We have a pollution problem. In Italy, for instance, six million people live in areas which have a high level of pollution. So we have to solve the problem. And these people get sick without knowing why. Asbestos problem, um, contaminated, polluted sites where children get sick. We have to address the problem. So the ecology can provide an answer to all these problems. And as Monica and Kalima have, Karima have said, ecology have an answer for the economic development, labor issues, uh, economic independence of Europe from countries which are unstable and are not democratic. Ecology also can provide an answer to uh, immigration and climate change. And finally, Cote Romero was saying yesterday, yesterday that energy strategies are key, are very important to exit this blackmail that the fossil sector is doing and not to have fear, because what we have now is fear, and with uh, fear, they try to keep us down. And uh, what we can do from in this forum in the South is to export and to create with pride a Mediterranean model, because we've tried to import models from other countries. But we can say something very different with the sun, the wind, what we can do, and the beauty of our countries and our landscape. We can export the model. Thank you.